1966, Timothy Leary famously advised us baby boomers to turn on, tune in, and drop out. The idea that teenagers could take control of their lives galvanized me into action. I biked down to Ted's drugstore and bought my first rock album. It was The Doors. <laughs> I put the family record player on the piano bench next to me, and I played over and over along with Ray Manzarek's hypnotic bass line to Soul Kitchen. Yeah, crank it up. For the first time, I was physically and emotionally engaged with the music. Ah, wow. I went out and bought more rock albums. I joined rock bands with names like The Avengers <laughs> and The Unlimited Five, although our friends refer to us as The Untalented Five. <laughs> yeah. But music became my BFF. Well, and it still is here, 50 years later. And so the other day, I was out raking leaves, and I thought, hey, you know, I can, I can stream anything I want. So I put in my earbuds, and I got my iPhone out, and I started streaming Soul Kitchen. <laughs> what the? Where did the bass line go? What? Wait a minute. Then I went back to the CD. There it is. So for comparison's sake, I went back to the MP3 to listen to it. Holy cow, what did they do to my music? And then I realized it wasn't they, it wasn't them, it was me. I had, with my earbuds and my MP3s, completely become complicit in the distortion of sound. All right. And I thought of Neil Postman, the author of Technopoly, The Surrender of Culture to Technology, and I remembered that he wrote, to be unaware that a technology comes equipped with a program to change society, to maintain that technology is always neutral. And to make the assumption that technology is always a friend to culture is, at this late hour, stupidity, plain and simple. And then I thought, well, heck, I'm a neuromusicologist. I should look into this. And I did. And here and now, I want to talk to you about how your brain can hear more than you might think. All right. So one of your brain's super hearing powers is the head-related transfer function. Sound represents motion. And so your brain takes the incoming signals that bounce off of your nose and the folds of your pinna. It listens for frequencies canceling each other out as they bounce around your 3D environment. And you are able to detect proximity and direction of motion with two, millis two microsecond accuracy. All right, so you are able to survive in, in the environment and even thrive in it, reacting quickly, even in the dark. Another one of your brain's superpowers is sonic scene analysis. Your brain takes the incoming signals and compares them to sonic models that you carry around in your memory. You're out on the savanna, and you are hunting by moonlight. You hear a rustling to the left, even before you see the bush shake. What's it going to be? Fight, flight, or freeze? You know there's something to eat out here, you choose flight, because this time, it was, it was almost you. <laughs> All right. 
So we are able to do many things with our hearing. Let's switch to a more civilized setting. You're at a cocktail party, and you hear somebody say your name. It's the couple over in the corner. With your ability to attend to specific sounds in a noisy environment, you are able to zero in on their conversation. And while you're listening, a band starts warming up in the next room. You recognize the sound of music. And your reward system kicks in, as if to say, splish, splash, I was taking a bath. How did I know that there was a party going on? Well, music also, as we know, has the ability to evoke emotions. Our brains take in audio signals and form complex sensations like pleasure and fear and sadness and joy. Feelings that humans have learned to express through music. I keep thinking back to that sad day when my childhood sweetheart rejected me. <laughs> I wandered over to the piano, sat down, started noodling all around, and kept coming back to that sad, sad song that was at the top of the charts in the spring of 1970. A rainy night in Georgia. That poor kid. <laughs> Music also has the power to control our bodies. When you dance or march or exercise to music or play a musical instrument or sing, you are engaging in musical embodiment. Now, dynamic changes in music can also trigger something called chills or goosebumps. These come with increases in skin conductance and respiration, pulse rates, and uh, increased neurological responses. Now, can you find the chill moment in this piece of music? Well, now they know. Let it go. Let it go. I still get chills every time I hear that. How many got chills? How many people got a chill? Okay. All right. So. Our, our brains can do so much more with music than we might think. And at this point, I'd like to take you through a brief history of mobile music technology. In 1888, Thomas Edison sent his perfected phonograph to London along with a recording, one of the first musical recordings of Sir Arthur Sullivan's The Lost Chord. <laughs> Sir Arthur wrote back immediately and said, I can only say that I am astonished and somewhat terrified at the result of this evening's experiments, astonished at the wonderful power that you have developed, and terrified at the thought that so much hideous and bad music may be put on record forever. Well, nevertheless, Musical recordings caught on. Now, listening to music had always been a communal affair, but people longed to have a more personal and private um, experience. And so the race for portable music technology was on. <laughs> okay, so maybe radios weren't the perfect personal entertainment device, but in the mid-60s, we got eight-track cassettes. How many people had eight-tracks? Okay, I don't see anybody under 30, even anybody <laughs> under, under 60 raising their hands out there. Okay, um, eight-track cassettes, and then we had audio cassettes in the late 70s. Then in the 80s, everything changed. We got DAT players, and we got CD players. And today, you are able to stream almost any tune you want at any time you want, from any point on the planet. And therein lies the problem. 
okay? With its ability to deliver MP3s 24-7, Technopoly has completed the assimilation of our musical heritage. And I, for one, welcome our new auditory overlords. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but this golden transition from analog to digital came at a great price. Okay, so how does Technopoly continue to distort our concept of sound? Well, to begin with, Stereophonic recording is a one-dimensional recreation of humans performing in 3D acoustic space. In a typical recording session, the microphones are placed in close proximity to the sound sources, and these monophonic signals are then mixed down with different amplifications on left and right. When you put earbuds in, you're defeating your head-related transfer function, and so you're not getting the full picture. The stretching of sound sources along the line between your ears is far removed from the original performance. You're not getting the full picture. You're not even getting two dimensions out of three. These sounds bounce off every surface and they resonate. Impossible to pick up in a stereophonic recording, or recreate. All right, the next thing that Technopoly does is it degrades the signal. Here's where lossy compression enters the picture. MP3s use something called perceptual encoding. They take CD quality audio and remove the pieces that it thinks you can't hear. So take the Mona Lisa. Uh, it looks fine on your smartphone, JPEG, 20, 72 dots per inch, but when you blow it up, it doesn't look so good on your laptop. Well, lossy compression is to music what pixelation is to art. So here we have this dichotomy. We have this thing that we really like. We appreciate the original, but we struggle with the crude copy. Well, in order to study how the brain deals with musical information. We used magnetoencephalography, or MEG, to examine the brains of subjects listening to and watching clips from Star Trek for the voyage home. We played just the video and played just the audio, and we got what we expected. The uh, corresponding visual and auditory areas of the brain light it lit up, but when we played them together, a funny thing happened. The auditory areas did most of the heavy lifting and they did it with less effort. So what was this? And we found out that um, the doctrine of inverse effectiveness took over. Stein and Stafford discovered this in 2008 and they say that multisensory enhancement is inversely related to the effectiveness of the individual cues being combined. All right, so the idea is, let's bring something back into our music. How can we retrieve these audio cues that are missing? Well, one answer is sub-audible supplementation. If the inventors of this technology are correct, it increases definition to enhance our emotional engagement. Grammy award-winning producers and engineers are now beta testing this software, and they say things like, impressive, and wow, it just sounds better and amazing. I, I wish I could go back and remaster everything I've already done. So these are expert listeners, and these are testimonials. You take an original signal. From this, you make a customized noise signal. It's sub-audible. That's how you tell it's working, right? You can't hear it. <laughs> well, I blew it up. It sounds like this. When you add that signal back in, it sounds like this. All right, so we are doing some preliminary studies on this, and 
they are promising. Um, what we're finding is that inverse effectiveness actually does take hold, that the untreated signal engages, of course, the auditory areas, but the treated signal lets the brain hear more with less effort. So until this comes to market, what are some things that you can do <laughs> to hear more, to reduce stress, to kick in your reward system, and to increase your emotional and intellectual and social engagements? Well, one thing you can do is support live music. Go to concerts. It's <laughs> Studies show that going to concerts reduces your cortisol level and consequently reduces stress. All right. You can also get out your CDs and your vinyl and start listening to them again. You know, we all made a pledge to convert all of our records to digital when we were able to start burning CDs. How many people actually ever did that? <laughs> okay. No, that one, okay, yeah. Um, and um, you can listen over loudspeakers, um, do group listening, but you can embody music, you can play an instrument, go dancing, exercise to music, you know, join a jam session, um, get into the whole embodiment thing to truly appreciate your music. In the meantime, um, I'm going to turn on my turntable and tune into my sonic environment and drop out of the interweb for a while, you know, just occasionally. I'm going to take those old records off the shelf and not sit and listen to them by myself, though. <laughs> so I hope you'll join me. Thank you. <laughs>